you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was concluding the sermon when he said this. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him to a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, shall be likened to a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Hello, friends. I am Bishop Jerry Hayes, Abbot General of the Apostolic Disciples of the Way, and uh, you are watching episode number 73 of the Bible verse by verse. And in this particular episode number 73, we're going to be concluding Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Before we go to the word of the Lord, Let's go to the Lord of the Word in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, you who sit upon the circle of the earth, we ask that you would illumine all in us that is darkness and anoint our minds and our hearts and our lips, that we might perceive, that we might believe, and that we might speak your word with conviction and clarity. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen and amen. So we're going to go right to this, these concluding remarks of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount and uh, also uh, Matthew's end words in commentary concerning Jesus' sermon. Uh, let's go right to it today. Now, to do uh, this particular episode, I, I need to recap a little bit. I need to go back and speak on some things, just, just touch on them that we have already talked about in the concluding uh, remarks of Christ in the wind-up of this sermon of all sermons. Uh, let me speak to you just a little bit concerning verses 13 through 28. This is the final section of the Sermon on the Mount, and it's composed, and I'm sure that you've noticed it, and I have made reference to it on a number of occasions. It's composed of a series of antitheses or parallelisms. Uh, notice from verses 13 through 14, we have the two ways, and they are paralleled to one another, and one's an antithesis of the other. And then in verses uh, 15 through 20, we have the, the two trees, uh, the good tree and the evil tree. In verses 21 through 23, we have the two professions, <coughs> the profession of the people who say, we have done many wonderful things in your name, and then the profession of Christ. Well, I never knew you, not at any time. And in the reading that we had tonight from verses 24 through 27, we have uh, the story of the Two builders, one built his house on the rock and the rains came and it stood. One built his house on the sand, the rains came and uh, it washed away. Now in these uh, antitheses kind of teaching that Jesus is winding up his Sermon on the Mount is, uh, in, uh, it well, was, a, was a system or a, a method of teaching that was practiced both by Judaism and the Greco-Roman philosophies. They all use this two-way teaching method. And uh, we've already mentioned that we can even see this in uh, the uh, uh, anti nicene Father uh, book called The Gospel of Barnabas and also 
in the early Christian writing called the Didache or the teaching of the 12 apostles. We see the two ways and uh, Jesus definitely employed it here in his sermon on the mount. And there are two ways, the way of life and the way of death. I probably need to go back and, and do some recapping on the idea of demons because uh, Jesus <coughs> said that many will say to him in that day, we have cast out devils in your name, so forth and so on. And uh, so this idea of the existence of evil spirits or the existence of demons is something that Jesus just took for granted and he encountered it during his ministry and the disciples encountered it during their preaching and the early mission days of the church. And we encounter them today also, uh, although people uh, would want to not recognize their existence. And they would say, well, maybe they exist in third world countries or in the jungles of Africa or in some among some educated people, but surely not in the first world countries of Europe and America. Uh, but friends, uh, it's just that they're more sophisticated in a sophisticated country, but they exist just as much and maybe even more so uh, in America than anywhere else in the world. Now, uh, the Bible here talks about, Jesus talks about people professing to cast out devils. Now, literally, it's demons. Now, the, the devil that in the Bible is designated Satan are the devil. Now, there's only one uh, of, of him, <laughs> and uh, he is not omnipresent like God. He can't be everywhere at once. And uh, he's not, he, he is limited to one geographical location at a time. He's not omnipresent. He's not omni-knowing. Uh, he depends upon his organization of fallen angels and demons to uh, operate his mischief throughout uh, the world. But there are many demons. Uh, this word means disembodied spirits. And uh, the spirit world then is populated by two categories of spirit beings. There are beings of light that we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 14 and 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. Now, the, 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 the beings of light would be the angels of God and the messengers of the Lord. And we don't know uh, what kind of number that uh, they comprise, but there is a great host of them. Then there are the beings of darkness uh, that we read about in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14 and Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. Now, the beings of darkness are the uh, fallen angels and the demons, and there are two different categories of the beings uh, of darkness. There is the fallen angels. We read about them in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 4 and, chapter, and verses 7 through 9. These are those angels that sided with Lucifer back when Lucifer read a re revolt uh, in heaven. He did, you know. And uh, it, during this revolt, there was one third of the host of heaven, the Bible says, that sided with him in his revolt against God. When he did not want to dethrone God necessarily, but he wanted to exalt himself to be equal with God. And of course, that uh, coup did not end very well. It ended with Satan and his cohorts being expelled physically from heaven uh, to the earth and other regions of the universe. Now, uh, these beings of darkness, like I said, are two, two subcategories, the fallen angels that I've just talked about, and the demons. Now, the demons are different from fallen angels. We read about the demons in Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 7, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 24, Mark chapter 5 and verse 12, and 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 20, 1 Timothy 
and uh, chapter 4 and verse 1, and James chapter 2 and verse 19, and Revelation chapter 18 and verse 2. I mean, demons or evil spirits are all throughout the New Testament. It's just uh, the, the Bible doesn't set about prove, trying to prove the existence of demons. It just assumes the reality of them. Just like the Bible doesn't try to prove the existence of God, he's just assumed to be a fact, assumed to be a reality. Uh, so, so too, the whole spirit world, the, the plethora of spirit beings. Now, the fallen angels includes Satan. And uh, I've already referenced uh, a little bit about the revolt against God and the angels that sided with, with him, and they were expelled from heaven with their leader, Lucifer. The word Lucifer means uh, son of the morning, and Lucifer was their covering cherub. He was, it seems that he was next in command to God. He was a second in command in heaven, but that wasn't quite good enough. He was actually the God of this world, of this planet, but he wasn't content with that. Now, some of these fallen angels, some of this one third of the fallen angels that were cast out of heaven with Lucifer are not free. They are confined. They are in the change of, in the chains of a, a compartment of the underworld called Tartarus, according to Second Peter chapter 2, and verse 4, they are there because of their particular type of transgression that we read about in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Uh, this group uh, left their first estate, uh, took human form, and actually cohabited with human women and produced a race of giants that we read about in uh, the book of Genesis. Now, there, this particular group uh, was, uh, and the flood came upon the earth because of this transgression. And this particular group are in chains. They have been arrested and they have been incarcerated in Tartarus. Uh, but there are a larger group of the fallen angels that are employed by their archangel, which is Lucifer, the one that we call Satan, or the devil. They're employed as his lieutenants, uh, as regents of this world. Uh, in Daniel chapter 10 and verse 13 and chapter 20, we read about the prince of Persia and the prince of Babylon. These are uh, uh, princes of fallen angels that are Lucifer, Satan's lieutenants, that have particular portions of the world under their influence. Now, the demons, the disembodied spirits, are the minions of the fallen angels. Now, the origin of demons is most likely uh, the judgment which came upon that pre-Adamic earth, that earth that existed before Adam and Eve. You know, the Bible opens up in Genesis 1 and 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in verse 2, and the earth was without form and void and darkness covered the face of the deep. Between verse 1 and verse 4, uh, there was a, a completely, uh, complete, there was a complete and whole operational universe in place that we call the pre-Adamic world, the pre-Adamic earth. How long that time existed, we don't know. But in verse 2 of Genesis chapter 1, the earth had been judged and had fallen into its chaotic state of darkness was everywhere and, and the earth and the water had commingled and uh, God had to set the earth in order again. So what we read about in Genesis chapter 1 is a restructuring, is a renovation of an old earth. Now in that pre-Adamic earth, in that earth before Adam, that's what pre-Adamic means, its inhabitants played a role in Lucifer's revolt against heaven. 
And it seems that part of their judgment was that they were disembodied. They lost their bodies, but their uh, spirit being was remained upon the planet, remained uh, in the earth. So the judgment left them bodiless. And uh, because of their presence in the earth, when Adam and Eve were placed here, uh, Adam and Eve were empowered and instructed by God to subdue the planet. And the subduing of the planet uh, had to do with bringing this spirit world under control, bringing it in check. That was humanity's main job. Now, it's not certain if we read about a character in the Bible called Beelzebub, and it's not certain if this is a reference to Satan or to a particular prince, lieutenant of Satan, that's placed directly over the demons. We read about Apollyon in the book of Revelation or Abaddon. Uh, we know that he is the angel of the abyss uh, from Revelation chapter 9 and verse 11, whose name means destroyer. And he is said to be king over the demon locust that the book of Revelation says will torment the earth for five months. Now, demons, we know from the Bible, from Matthew chapter 9 and verse 33, demons cause diseases, and because they have been deprived of their physical bodies, they seek to possess human bodies or even the bodies of animals. Matthew chapter 2, verses 43 through 45. Also, you need to look at Matthew chapter 4 and verse 24, and then Mark chapter 5 and uh, verse 13, you read about how that uh, the demons, when they came in contact with Jesus, uh, legions, they were called, uh, they didn't want to be cast out, just cast out of the man, uh, the demonic, but they wanted, they requested to go, have permission to go into the hogs, go into the swine, and Jesus gave them that permission. And of course, the swine then uh, kill themselves when the demons enter them. They, they run down a steep hill into a body of water and there kill themselves. Uh, so demons, because they've been disembodied, they, they desire a body, and uh, either human or animal. And fallen angels are spirit bodies. They, they, have, they have spirit bodies of their own. And they do not seek to possess uh, others. So there's just a, a recapping and maybe a, a, a little bit of explanation of this spirit world and the operating of this spirit world and where these demons and these fallen angels come from that Jesus comes on the scene teaching and ministering and just uh, encountering these evil spirits and encountering these fallen angels and uh, just uh, not explaining where they come from, but just uh, assuming and, and, and talking about their presence in a very forthright manner. So maybe you have there a little bit of context. Now, in our uh, scripture today, uh, Jesus said, He who hears the words of my, saying, uh, of my, of my sayings and, and does them, applies them, he said, I will liken him to a man who builds his house upon a rock. In other words, if we build our lives, that's what Jesus is talking about, on the principles of his teaching, and we apply them sincerely to our lives, then our life is going to be built upon solid footing. But Jesus said, a man who does not follow my teachings, who does not uh, heed my words, I will liken him to a man who builds his house upon the sand. Now, Jesus talks about the rains coming and the wind blowing. And the man who has his house built upon the teachings, upon the sayings of Christ, well, his life is going to stand 
sure. But the individual who has ignored the sayings of Christ, who has ignored the teachings of the master, when the storms of life come, his life and the things that he has built is going to be washed away. Now, one thing that I want us to take away from this is, is the storms of life come on everyone. Whether you choose to build your house on the rock or on the sand, each house is going to be subjected to the same storms of life. A Christian is not exempt from the storms of life. The storms come upon the Christian just like they come on the non-believer. The only difference is the Christian has built upon something of substance. He has built his life, his family, his children on uh, the, the sayings of Jesus. From the moment that the child uh, could learn to even pay attention to words, the mother and the father begin to teach them uh, the sayings of Jesus. Many of us, we were taught to read with the Bible. Uh, we were taught a vocabulary through uh, the songbook that we use in uh, public worship. So when we build our lives upon those principles, when the storms come that wash others away, we remain. A Christian is not exempt, and that's the thing I want to really emphasize. A Christian is not exempt from the storms of life. The same storm, the same rain falls on the just and on the unjust. It's just the foundation of a Christian's life is the teachings of Christ, the foundation of the lives of others uh, are not. Therefore, uh, they do not have a solid footing. So when the storms come, they just wash away. Verse 18, verse 28, Jesus, uh, Matthew said, when Jesus had ended these sayings, now we've come to the conclusion of the sermon. And Matthew says, when Jesus had ended these sayings. Now, you know, we talk about Matthew writing the gospel in five books, and he builds his five sections of his gospel around five different sermons that Christ preached, five discourses. So in each one of these discourses, when Matthew gets to the end of it, he ends each sermon with these words, with this formula, when Jesus had ended these sayings. Now, these are the similar words that uh, Matthew writes to conclude each of the five discourses of Jesus that we find in uh, here and in chapter 11 and verse 1. Chapter 13 and verse 53, chapter 19 and verse 1, chapter 26 and verse 1, when Jesus had ended these sayings. Now, the people marveled in verse 29 that Jesus did not teach like the scribes did. Now, uh, the, the scribes had to rely on tradition for their authority, but Jesus' authority was his own. The scribes would say something like, it is written. Jesus would say, I say unto you. Amen. Uh, now, it disturbed the Pharisees that he had no credentials as an official teacher in their particular system. He didn't graduate from some rabbinical school. Yet his knowledge astounded them. And even their officers admitted in John chapter 7 and verse 46, never a man spake like this man. Now we have just concluded the Sermon on the Mount, the moral teachings of Christ, the kingdom manifesto. Jesus has pointed out to the things that was written and the things was said, but he said many times, but I say unto you, the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew intends for us to identify this with uh, Moses going up into Mount Sinai and receiving the Ten Words, receiving the Ten Commandments, and come and bringing that law to the people of God. Matthew is equating 
the Ten Commandments on the Sermon on the Mount on, on the from Mount Sinai with Jesus's instructions here on the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew is is uh, has already developed, and now he's walking through his Moses Exodus motif, uh, comparing his parallelism between Moses and the Exodus from Egypt to Jesus and his Exodus from Judaism. The Lord bless you, friends. Uh, we have come to a milestone of our the Bible verse by verse when we have finished the moral teachings of Christ, the, uh, the kingdom manifesto, and uh, we finished book one of the Gospel of Matthew, and now when we come back, we'll be going into book two of the Gospel of Matthew. Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us uh, our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, in whom is the Father who made us, the Son who saved us, and the Holy Ghost that sanctifies us. Beloved, it's my prayer that the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and God pres preserve you faultless and blameless unto his coming in both spirit, soul, and body. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.